The Glass Castle, pages 260 to 273. Mom and Dad survived the winter, but every time I saw them, they looked a little worse for wear, dirtier, more bruised, their hair more matted. Don't you fret a bit, Dad said. Have you ever known your old man to get himself into a situation he couldn't handle? I kept telling myself that Dad was right, that they knew how to look after themselves and each other, but in the spring, Mom called me to say Dad had come down with tuberculosis. Dad almost never got sick. He was always getting banged up and then recovering almost immediately, as if nothing could truly hurt him. A part of me still believed all those childhood stories he told us about how invincible he was. Dad had asked that no one visit him, but Mom said she thought he'd be pretty pleased if I dropped by the hospital. I waited at the nurse's station while an orderly went to tell him he had a visitor. I thought Dad might be under an oxygen tent or lying in a bed coughing up blood into a white handkerchief. But after a minute, he came hurrying down the hall. He was paler and more gaunt than usual. But despite all his years of hard living, he had aged very little. He still had all his hair, and it was still coal black, and his dark eyes twinkled above the paper surgical mask he was wearing. He wouldn't let me hug him. Whoa, Nellie, stay back, he said. You're sure a sight for sore eyes, honey, but I don't want you catching this son of a bitch of a bug. Dad escorted me back to the TB ward and introduced me to all of his friends. Believe it or not, old Rex Walls did produce something worth bragging about, and here she is, he told them. Then he started coughing. Dad, are you going to be okay? I asked. Ain't none of us getting out of this alive, honey, Dad said. It was an expression he used a lot, and now he seemed to find a special satisfaction in it. Dad led me over to his cot. A neat pile of books was stacked next to it. He said his bout with TB had sent him to pondering about morality and the nature of the cosmos. He'd been stone-cold sober since entering the hospital and reading a lot more about chaos theory, particularly about the work of Mitchell Fijenbaum, a physicist at Los Alamos, who had made a study of the transition between order and turbulence. Dad said he was damned if Feigenbaum didn't make a persuasive case that turbulence was not in fact random, but followed a sequential spectrum of varying frequencies. If every action in the universe that we thought was random actually conformed to a rational pattern, Dad said, that implied the existence of a divine creator. And he was beginning to rethink his atheistic creed. I'm not saying there's a bearded old geezer named Yahweh up in the clouds deciding which football team is going to win the Super Bowl, Dad said. But if the physics, the quantum physics, suggests that God exists, I'm more than willing to entertain the notion. Dad showed me some of his calculations that he'd been working on. He saw me looking at his trembling fingers and held them up. Lack of liquor or fear of God. Don't know which is causing it, he said. Maybe both. Promise you'll stay here until you get better, I said. I don't want you doing the skedaddle. Dad burst into laughter that ended in another coughing fit. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Dad stayed in the hospital for six weeks. By then, he'd not only beaten back the TB, he'd been sober longer than any time since the Phoenix detox. He knew that if he went back to the streets, he'd start drinking again. One of the hospital administrators got him a job as a maintenance man at an upstate resort, room and board included. He tried to talk Mom into going with him, but she flatly refused. Upstate's the sticks, she said. So Dad went alone. He called me from time to time, and it sounded like he'd put together a life that worked for him. He had a one-room apartment over a garage, enjoyed doing the repairs and upkeep on the old lodge, loved being back within walking distance of untamed country, and was staying sober. Dad worked at the resort through the summer and into the fall. As it began to turn cold again, Mom called him and mentioned how much easier it was for two people to stay warm during the winter, and how much Tinkle the dog missed him. In November, after the first hard frost, I got a call from Brian, who said that Mom had succeeded in persuading Dad to quit his job and return to the city. Do you think he'll stay sober? I asked. He's already back on the booze, Brian said. A few weeks after Dad got back, I saw him at Lori's. He was sitting on the sofa with an arm around Mom and a pint bottle in his hand. He laughed. This crazy-ass mother of yours can't live with her, can't live without her, and damned if she doesn't feel the same about me. All of us kids had our own lives by then. I was in college. Lori had become an illustrator at a comic book company. Maureen lived with Lori and went to high school. Brian, who had wanted to be a cop ever since he had a call a, a policeman to a house in Phoenix to break up a fight between mom and dad, had become a warehouse foreman and was serving in the auxiliary force until he was old enough to take the police department's entrance exam. 
Mom suggested we all celebrate Christmas at Lori's apartment. I bought Mom an antique silver cross, but finding a gift for Dad was harder. He always said he never needed anything, since it looked like it was going to be another hard winter, and since Dad wore nothing but his bomber jacket, even in the coldest weather. I decided to get him some warm clothes. At an army surplus store, I bought flannel shirts, thermal underwear, thick wool socks, the kind of blue work pants that auto mechanics wear, and a new pair of steel-toed boots. Lori decorated her apartment with colored lights and pine bows and paper angels. Brian made eggnog, and to demonstrate that he was on his best behavior, Dad went to great lengths to make sure there was no alcohol in it before he accepted a glass. Mom passed around their presents, each wrapped in newspaper and tied with a butcher's twine. Lori got a cracked lamp that might have been a Tiffany. Maureen, an antique porcelain doll that had lost most of her hair. Brian, a 19th century book of poetry, missing the cover and the first few pages. My present was an orange crew neck sweater, slightly stained, but made, Mom pointed out, of genuine Shetland wool. When I passed Dad my stack of carefully wrapped boxes, he protested that he needed and wanted nothing. Go ahead, I said. Open them. I watched as he carefully removed the wrapping. He lifted the lids and stared at the folded clothes. His face took on a wounded expression he got whenever the world called his bluff. You must be mighty ashamed of your old man, he said. What do you mean? I asked. You think I'm some sort of goddamn charity case. Dad stood up and put on his bomber jacket. He was avoiding all our eyes. Where are you going? I asked. Dad just turned up his collar and walked out of the apartment. I listened to the sound of his boots going down the stairs. What did I do? I asked. Look at it from his perspective, Mom said. You buy him all these nice new things and all he has for you is junk from the street. He's the father. He's the one who's supposed to be taking care of you. The room was quiet for a while. I guess you don't want your presents either, I said to Mom. Oh no, she said. I love getting presents. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. The following summer, Mom and Dad were heading into their third year on the streets. They'd figure out how to make it work for them, and I gradually came around to accepting the notion that whether I liked it or not, this was how it was going to be. It's sort of the city's fault, Mom told me. They make it too easy to be homeless. If it was really unbearable, we'd do something different. In August, Dad called to go over my course selection for the fall semester. He also wanted to discuss some of the books on the reading lists. Since he'd come to New York, he'd been borrowing my assigned books from the public library. He'd read every single one, he said, so he could answer any questions I might have. Mom said it was his way of getting a college education along with me. When he asked me what courses I had signed up for, I said, I'm thinking of dropping out. The hell you are, Dad said. I told him that while most of my tuition was covered by grants and loans and scholarships, the school expected me to contribute $2,000 a year. But over the summer, I had only been able to save $1,000. I needed another 1000 and had no way to come up with it. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Dad asked. Dad called a week later and told me to meet him at Lori's. When he arrived with Mom, he was carrying a large plastic garbage bag and had a small brown paper bag tucked under his arm. I assumed it was a bottle of booze. But then he opened the paper bag and turned it upside down. Hundreds of dollar bills, ones, fives, tens, twenties, all wrinkled and worn, spilled into my lap. There's 950 bucks, Dad said. He opened the plastic bag and a fur coat tumbled out. That there's mink. You should be able to pawn that for 50, at least. I stared at the loot. Where did you get all of this? I finally asked. New York City is full of poker players who wouldn't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Dad, I said... You guys need this money more than I do. It's yours, Dad said, since when is it wrong for a father to take care of his little girl? But I can't, I looked at Mom. She sat down next to me and patted my leg. I've always believed in the value of a good education, she said. So when I enrolled for my final year at Barnard, I paid what I owed on my tuition with Dad's wadded, crumpled bills. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. A month later, I got a call from Mom. She was so excited she was tripping over her own words. She and Dad had found a place to live. Their new home, Mom said, was in an abandoned building on the Lower East Side. It's a tad run down, she admitted, but all it really needs is a little TLC, and the best of all, it's free. Other folks were also moving into the abandoned building, she said. They were called squatters, and the buildings were called squats. Your father and I are pioneers, Mom said just like my great-great-grandfather who helped tame the Wild West. 
Mom called in a few weeks and said that although the squat still needed a few finishing touches, a front door, for example, she and Dad were officially accepting visitors. I took the subway to Astro Place on late spring day and headed east. Mom and Dad's apartment was in a six-story walk-up. The mortar was crumbling and the bricks had come loose. All the windows on the first floor had been boarded up. I reached to open the building's front door, but where the lock and handle should have been, there was only a hole. Inside, a single naked light bulb hung from a wire in the hallway. On one wall, chunks of plaster had crumbled away, revealing the wooden ribs and pipes and wiring. On the third floor, I knocked on the door to Mom and Dad's apartment and heard Dad's muffled voice. Instead of the door swinging inward, fingers appeared on both sides and was lifted out of the frame altogether. There was Dad beaming and hugging me while he went on about how he'd yet to install the door hinges. As a matter of fact, they'd only just gotten the door itself, which he found in the basement of another abandoned building. Mom came running up behind him, grinning so widely you could see her molars, and gave me a big hug. Dad knocked the cat off a chair they had already taken in a few strays and offered me a seat. The room was crammed with broken furniture, bundles of clothes, stacks of books, and Mom's art supplies. Four or five electric space heaters blasted away. Mom explained that Dad had hooked up every squat in the building to an insulated cable he hot-wired off a utility pole down the block. We're all getting free juice, thanks to your father, Mom said. No one in the building could survive without him. Dad chuckled modestly. He told me how complicated the process had been because the wiring in the building was so ancient. Damnedest electrical system I'd ever seen, he said. The manual must have been written in hieroglyphics. I looked around and it hit me that if you replaced the electric heaters with a coal stove, the squat on the Lower East Side looked pretty much like the house on Little Hubbard Street. I had escaped from Welch once, and now, breathing in the same old smells of turpentine, dog hair, and dirty clothes, of stale beer and cigarette smoke and unrefrigerated food slowly going bad, I had the urge to bolt. But Mom and Dad were clearly proud, and as I listened to them talk, interrupting each other in their excitement to correct points of fact and filling gaps in the story about their fellow squatters and their friends they made in the neighborhood and the common fight against the city housing agency. It became clear they'd stumbled upon an entire community of people like themselves, people who lived unruly lives battling authority and who liked it that way. After all those years of roaming, they found home. I graduated from Barnard that spring. Brian came to the ceremony, but Lori and Maureen had to work and mom said it would just be a lot of boring speeches about the long and winding road of life. I wanted dad to come, but chances were he'd show up drunk and try to debate the commencement speaker. I can't risk it, dad, I told him. Hell, he said, I don't have to see my mountain goat grabbing a sheepskin to know she's got her college degree. The magazine where I'd been working two days a week had offered me a full-time job. What I needed was a place to live. For several years, I had been dating a man named Eric a friend of one of Lori's eccentric, genius friends who came from a wealthy family, ran a small company, and lived alone in an apartment on Park Avenue in which he had been raised. He was a detached, almost fanatically organized guy who maintained detailed time management logs and could recite endless baseball statistics. But he was decent and responsible, never gambled or lost his temper, and always paid bills on time. When he heard that I was looking for a roommate to share an apartment, he suggested I move in with him. I couldn't afford half the rent, I told him, and I wouldn't live there unless I could pay my own way. He suggested I begin paying what I could afford, and as my salary went up, I would increase the payment. He made it sound like a business proposition, but a solid one, and after thinking it over, I agreed. When I told Dad about my plans, he asked if Eric made me happy and treated me well, because if he doesn't, Dad said, I will by God kick his butt so hard his asshole will be up between his shoulder blades. He treats me fine, Dad, I said. What I wanted to say was that I knew Eric would never try to steal my paycheck or throw me out the window, that I'd always been terrified that I'd fall for a hard-drinking, hell-raising, charismatic scoundrel like you, Dad, but I wound up with a man who is exactly the opposite. All of my belongings fit into two plastic milk crates and a garbage bag. I hauled them to the street, hailed a taxi, and took it across town to Eric's building. The doorman, in a blue uniform with gold piping, hurried out from under the awning and insisted on carrying the milk crates into the lobby. Eric's apartment had cross beam ceilings and a fireplace with an art deco mantle. I actually live on Park Avenue, I kept telling myself as I hung my clothes in the closet Eric had cleared out for me. Then I started thinking about mom and dad. When they had moved into their squat, 
A 15-minute subway ride south and about half a dozen worlds away, it seemed as if they had finally found the place where they belonged, and I wondered if I had done the same. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. I invited mom and dad up to the apartment. Dad said he'd feel out of place and never did come, but mom visited almost immediately. She turned over dishes to read the manufacturer's name and lifted the corner of the Persian rug to count the knots. She held the china to the light and ran her finger along the antique campaign chest. Then she went to the window and looked out at the brick and the limestone apartment buildings across the street. I don't really like Park Avenue, she said. The architecture is too monotonous. I prefer the architecture of Central Park West. I told mom she was the snootiest squatter I'd ever met, and that made her laugh. We sat down on the living room couch. I had something I wanted to discuss with her. I now had a job, I said, and was in a position to help her and dad. I wanted to buy them something that would improve their lives. It could be a small car. It could be the security deposit and a few months rent on an apartment. It could be the down payment on a house in an inexpensive neighborhood. We don't need anything, mom said. We're fine. She put down her teacup. It's you I'm worried about. You're worried about me? Yes, very worried. Mom, I said, I'm doing very well. I'm very, very comfortable. That's what I'm worried about, Mom said. Look at the way you live. You've sold out. Next thing you know, you'll become a Republican. She shook her head. Where are the values I raised you with? Mom became even more concerned about my values when my editor offered me a job, writing a weekly column about what he called the behind-the-scenes doings of movers and shakers. Mom thought I should be writing exposés about oppressive landlords, social injustice, and the class struggle on the Lower East Side. But I leaped at the job because it meant I would become one of those people who knew what was really going on. Also, most people in Welch had a pretty good idea how bad off the Walls family was. But the truth was, they had their problems too. They were just better than we were at covering them up. I wanted to let the world know that no one had a perfect life, that even the people who seemed to have it all had their secrets. Dad thought it was great and that I was writing a weekly column about, as he put it, the skinny dames and the fat cats. He became one of my most faithful readers and would go to the library to research the people in the column, then call me with tips. This astro broad has one hell of a past, he told me one time. Maybe we should do a little digging in that direction. Eventually, even Mom acknowledged that I'd done all right. No one expected you to amount to much, she told me. Lori was the smart one, Maureen was the pretty one, and Brian the brave one. You never had much going for you except you always worked hard. I loved my new job even more than I loved my Park Avenue address. I was invited to dozens of parties a week, art gallery openings, benefit balls, movie premieres, book parties, and private dinners in marbled floor dining rooms. I met real estate developers, agents, heiresses, fund managers, lawyers, clothing designers, professional basketball players, photographers, movie producers, and television correspondents. I met people who owned entire collections of houses and spent more on one restaurant meal than my family had paid for 93 Little Hubbard Street. True or not, I was convinced that if all of these people found out about mom and dad and who I really was, it would be impossible for me to keep my job. So I avoided discussing my parents. When that was impossible, I lied. A year after I started the column, I was in a small overstuffed restaurant across the table from an aging, elegant woman in a silk turban who oversaw the international best dress list. Where are you from, Jeanette? West Virginia. Where? Welch. How lovely. What's the main industry in Welch? Coal mining. As she questioned me, she studied what I wore, assessing the fabric and appraising the cost of each item and making a judgment about my taste in general. And does your family own coal mines? No. What do your parents do? Mom's an artist. And your father? He's an entrepreneur. Doing what? I took your breath. He's developing a technology to burn low-grade biomimetous coal more efficiently. And they're still in West Virginia, she asked. I decided I might as well go all out. They love it there, I said. They have a great old house on a hill overlooking a beautiful river. They spent years restoring it. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. My life with Eric was calm and predictable. I liked it that way, and four years after I moved into his apartment, we got married. Shortly after the wedding, Mom's brother, my Uncle Jim, died in Arizona. Mom came to the apartment to give me the news and to ask a favor. We need to buy Jim's land, she said. 
Mom and her brother had each inherited half of the West Texas land that had been owned by their father. The whole time we kids were growing up, Mom had been mysteriously vague about how big and how valuable that land was. But I had the impression that this was a few hundred acres of more or less uninhabitable desert miles away from the road. We need to keep the land in the family, Mom told me. It's important for sentimental reasons. Let's see if we can buy it then, I said. How much will it cost? You can borrow the money from Eric now that he's your husband, Mom said. I've got a little money, I said. How much will it cost? I read somewhere that off-road land in parched West Texas sold for as little as $100 an acre. You can borrow from Eric, Mom said again. Well, how much? A million dollars. What? A million dollars. But Uncle Jim's land is the same size as your land, I said. I was speaking slowly because I wanted to make sure I understood the implications of what Mom had just told me. You each inherited half of Grandpa Smith's land. More or less, Mom said. So if Uncle Jim's land is worth a million dollars, that means that your land is worth a million dollars. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? It's the same size as his. I don't know how much it's worth because I never had it appraised. I was never going to sell it. My father taught me you never sell land. That's why you have to buy Uncle Jim's land. We have to keep it in the family. You mean you own land worth a million dollars? I was thunderstruck. All those years in Welch with no food, no coal, no plumbing, and Mom had been sitting on land worth a million dollars? Had all those years, as well as Mom and Dad's time on the street, not to mention their current life in an abandoned tenement, been caprice inflicted on us by Mom? Could she have solved our financial problems by selling this land she never even saw? But she avoided my questions, and it became clear that to Mom, holding on to land was not so much an investment strategy as it was an article of faith. A revealed truth as deeply felt and incontestable as her Catholicism. And for the life of me, I could not get her to tell me how much the land was worth. I told you I don't know, she said. Then tell me how many acres it is and where exactly it is, and I'll find out how much an acre of land it's going for in that area. I wasn't interested in her money. I just wanted to know, needed to know, the answer to my question. How much was that freaking land worth? Maybe she truly didn't know. Maybe she was afraid to find out. Maybe she was afraid of what we'd all think if we knew. But instead of answering me, she kept repeating that it was important to keep Uncle Jim's land, land that had belonged to her father and his father and his father before that, in the family. Mom, I can't ask Eric for a million dollars. Jeanette, I haven't asked you for a lot of favors, but I'm asking you for one now. I wouldn't if it wasn't important, but this is important. I told Mom I didn't think Eric would lend me a million dollars to buy some land in Texas. And even if he would, I wouldn't borrow it from him. It's too much money, I said. What would you do with the land? Keep it in the family? I can't believe you're asking me this, I said. I've never even seen that land. Jeanette, Mom said when she had accepted the fact that she would not get her way, I'm deeply disappointed in you. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Be sure that you have completed your table of contents for this reading section.